Yeah, in the world. Thank you, all everybody, world changers. We are back again for with this wonderful session with into uh, financial communication. And I will hand it over to Samuel Jane, our moderator for this session. I hope you all are going to enjoy this session. Thank you. Over to you, Samuel. Thank you so much, Yao. So uh, my name is uh, Samuel Mon Jane, and I'm <clears throat> from Kenya. So currently, I'm serving as the East African Regional Coordinator for the Travel for Change Adventures. And today, I'm happy to share with you uh, our topic for today and for this season. And that is on uh, financial education, especially on literacy. And so, without further ado, because I know we have enjoyed uh, much of the session since yesterday, I would like to introduce Mr. Philip Duro, who is our speaker for today. And uh, maybe if you allow me, I will maybe discuss with you uh, his biography so that we can be able to understand him more better. And even by the time we are actually doing for the session, we know who is speaking to us. And so Mr. Philip Duro is the founder of the Center for Financial Literacy Education Africa. He is a financial literature advocate and student activist who holds a certificate <coughs> certificate uh, in uh, security trading from the Ghana Stock Exchange. So Philip currently is serving as a student, is, is a four-year student at Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, reading, reading to the Bachelor of Science in Education Finance. So, and uh, Philip is passionate about finance and his goals is to become a solution, but not just a problem, but a solution to the whole world, having made him to develop a keen interest in driving the change and impacting the lives. So as a student, Philip has been able to be a lover of uh, Ubuntu and has received uh, numerous student uh, leadership roles from being the course, uh, course representative to a financial finance committee secretary and treasurer for student a representative council that is Jim, Jimpa, and many other. So Philip believes that, that this day and age of instant gratification and the last thing of many young people are thinking about planning for the future. Then uh, like uh, the company that is the uh, Center for Africa on Literature Education seek to guide young people and adults and on business to make sound financial decisions by establishing a center for excellence where they can always stand, stand to and uh, even learn more about their financial management, planning and investment. What he believes on is that the world will become better, a, a better place if we understand and locate our judicious uh, use of our funds you know, because that's why we are here to discuss the fund. And uh, this organization, they stand for, what they stand for is to teach other people in order, to, or in order for them to be able to understand what the financial issue is all about. So I know that uh, we may be curious to know what this topic is all about, but allow me to introduce by saying, we know that we are enjoying the African day which was yesterday, but we have taken some time back maybe to get to share more on read uh, in uh, the African. And so today, as we discuss our topic on financial literature, we know that Africa displays disparity both between countries and in terms of uh, economic as well as human, uh, human uh, development. And we know that on average, African countries have relatively low enrollment to school ratio, highly informal market, and high poverty rate, as well as uh, on how financial inclusion and financial literature, literature, literature are concerned. So as this backdrop, we know that there are desirable, desirable ways to improve the level of financial literacy among the most vulnerable parts of the African population. Well-designed financial education, as well as, in, uh, as well as initiative, could be able to reduce the demand side of both barriers 
on a financial on effective financial inclusion and this can be can be able to lead to vulnerable <coughs> individuals to improve economically so by by that being on cut then we know that if we can be able to get uh, <coughs> the financial literature then it means that we can be able to understand and manage our household resources also and also develop uh, uh, income generating activities that could be able to help that. And we know that maybe at one point, financial literacy is something that is not much uh, mentioned in school. And uh, we know that we really need to understand this. And we can see that a good number of countries, especially in Africa, have been able to do that. And South Africa is one of them which has been able to integrate maybe this uh, financial literature in their sense. That is both in mathematics, literature, and economic and management science. A good, an, a good, uh, a good other example is uh, Uganda, which has been able to put some capital market authority for Uganda to carry out school seminars and competition in order to, to be able to create uh, some a bit of, you know, uh, financial uh, finance finance uh, literature. And lastly. I, in terms of my list of examples, I would take, uh, I would mention Ghana, where our, our speaker comes from. And we know that the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning is enhancing the financial literature content in terms of uh, their school syllabus. And that has really helped in terms of uh, you know, improving the financial literature among, uh, among the students who are really going through the education system. And we know that in the recent in the recent public authorities in the recent years, public authorities have been able to partner with private sectors and also private uh, institutions to be able to enhance the development of financial education. And therefore, we know that uh, the Center for African Finance is one of the examples that we are going to discuss on how they are able to help that. And so that is why we have our Mr. Our speaker, that is Mr. Philip. And so. Mr. Philip, thank you so much for having me on board. And uh, maybe you take us through what uh, what the Center for Financial Literature Education is all about, and uh, maybe we can proceed from that. OK, thank you very much, Samuel. I am grateful, and uh, I think this is a wonderful platform to be on and to be part of this conference. When I hear anything about Africa, I'm interested because we want to see um, Africa develop to a point where we all feel comfortable living in it. And then as you can see, our name has, um, our organization has a name, um, the last ending part, Africa, not just limited to Ghana, even though it's situated in mm -hmm. Africa, yeah. uh, in Ghana, we are still in the continent Africa. So uh, we are hoping our dreams is to reach, send financial literacy across the continent, not just within Ghana. So that's the reason why in the first place you see Africa as part of our, our, our name. And then I, one of the most important thing I want to touch on is that I think um, this is a wonderful course we are all taking together. Um, thanks to everyone for joining this conference. Um, we are live now on Facebook, all the speakers. I think uh, I've learned a lot. And if you look at the vibrancy in these youths, the rising generation from all the speakers, the wealth of information that they possess, it, it's quite wonderful that um, we have South Africa and we're going to build that. Center for Financial Literacy, which I am I'm a co-founder. Uh, you made mention of a founder, but I am a co-founder uh, with Barbara and Peter, we are all Ghanaians, um, who we sat down and thought about the rising generation and how financial education is a global challenge. It's, it's quite unfortunate that there is a, there was um, a research that was conducted by SNP, Global Financial Literacy Survey. And it's found out that three in one people in the world are financially literate. So if you take out three people, it's just only one person that is financially educated that can actually talk about money and finances. So it's similar to the same thing as you, you made mention um, when you were given the background, Africa, we are not faring well. And then um, there is a need that we also look at that aspect. Much attention has not been drawn to the aspect of getting financial education. Uh, and then it has caused us a lot as, as, as a continent and as individual nations within the, the continent. So Center for, Center for Financial um, Literacy, Education Ghana, 
uh, Africa, it's situated in Ghana. And um, we are envisioned to have an African in which all people are financially literate and financially aware. And we are hoping to raise communities of financial literate where we can help people to understand how to better manage their finances. Uh, we hope to collaborate with so many people across um, the continent in order to see that um, we are going to bring light to this financial education aspect in here. Yeah. So we have so many partners in the US. We are also looking for partners around Africa, in Nigeria, in West African countries, East African, South Africa, or to work with in order to push this great agenda to build Africa we want. So um, we've done so much. We are also a lead ambassadors here in Ghana uh, for the improving financial literacy movement in Ghana, a movement that have helped um, set up a research center to delve more into study we understand more about our finances within Africa, which was established at the University of Ghana. Uh, we are hoping to extend it to other universities across the country and also even beyond Ghana as well. So that is something that we do. Uh, we do our Center for Financial Literacy in Africa. Okay. That's right, Commander. And thank you so much. Uh, I can see you're doing great work. And as I even mentioned that uh, I can see that even the, uh, your government is really doing and putting a lot of emphasis on financial exactly. literature because it is, it is important, I can tell you for sure it's important. And maybe someone would ask like, what are the benefits of maybe taking people to understand uh, what the, the financial education is all about? You no, know, probably someone could be asking, is this really important? <laughs> So uh, what, <laughs> what, uh, what are the advantages of uh, maybe get to understand uh, the financial education and if someone maybe understand it, then probably they can be able to make a, a better decision in terms of what they're doing. So sure. What specific yeah, thing you. Would, would you mention as the importance? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a wonderful question. The importance of this financial education, but one thing I want to establish is that when it comes to financial education, it's like any other education that we receive. It is a process and it's not an event that we will see. Uh, we're going to say that um, just we want to know everything a day about our finances. No, it takes a gradual process. You need to learn from one point to another. You need to graduate and study as we do, like from primary school throughout to our junior high to senior high to tertiary institutions, and then we move on ahead. So it's the same process that goes through. And it is very important for you to develop these financial skills in order for you to make well-informed financial decisions about yourself. But one of the most important things is about how you can be able to manage your resources at home. I love scenarios. We may recall when the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 set in. There were countries that were locking down. We had so many people kind of talking about their finances, businesses, people were laid off. We have people even couldn't afford just one day because some of them here in Ghana, we say hand to mouth. What they do is they walk out there, what they get in the morning, they, they, that's what they spend in the evening, that is all. So it became a very big problem for people to live whilst even not working. So it caused a need for us to try and help people because if these people had gotten the understanding of saving or have the, um, the, the habit of saving, Maybe during the lockdown period, they would have been able to save enough money that could at least take care of them for maybe a month or two. So one of the most important things is about you being able to manage your resources efficiently. It's one of the first important things I want to highlight that being in individuals, households, organizations, it helps you to allocate your resources efficiently and effectively and you'll be able to make your day-to-day -day financial decisions. You don't go out there to make an impulse buying because you have a budget. You don't just spend anyhow because you have a financial plan that you are following. When in times of crisis of emergency, you have funds to be able to um, handle your, your expenses or anything that comes out. It helps you to keep in check your buying behavior, your spending behavior. And it's one of the most important that can help you to avoid debt because you are so much loaded with debt. Anytime you receive your salary, <laughs> your account goes zero because you are betting with debt. Financial education is gonna help you to understand how you manage this debt, how you manage your spending, how you can budget, how you can plan. 
Another thing that also goes on to help the economy in terms of after talking about individual household is trying to allude to the fact that financial illiteracy can help improve financial inclusion. Education can help improve financial inclusion. Why do I say this? Um, recently, Center for Financial Literacy Education conducted a market survey at the Medina market, one of the big markets in, in Ghana. And um, it's, it's located in the greater Accra. And um, you realize that most of the people were not aware of some of the financial products that existed. All they knew was saving. Some didn't even know there's investment accounts. Some didn't even know there are retirement accounts, a whole lot. But then if you look across, there are some products that banks and financial institutions are offering that can at least benefit these individuals. And they do not know. They have no idea about it. Some even don't know whether they, they, there is a need for them to save. All they do is that after selling everything, they just go keep the money at home. And that is all. So these are some of the things that draw attention. When we have the perfect understanding of how we can be able to manage our resources, how we can be able to know the existence, having access to this financial product is going to help people contribute to the economy in a way that you are going to participate in the financial market. And you know, it is the whole of, it's kind of the engine of every economy. If the financial market is faring well, it translates to the growth and the development of every economy and building the structures of, of every economy. And it's also try, it also helps to bring some sanity into the system because the market is working. I, I, I love the, the stock market a lot. Uh, when, I, when I started my training in stock, in, in stock exchange, I had no idea about what happens in the stock exchange. And then this opportunity that I had to learn and educate myself, I got to understand some of the various investments that I can go into, the money market, the stock market, the capital market, so many other markets or so many investment vehicles that I could invest in. So I think that if the same thing is being done to people or if the same thing is being passed on to people, or people have been educated, it helps them to also get to abreast themselves with this kind of knowledge and also helps them to what? To, to invest, helping the economy and also improving the, the, the development of a country. So I think that is the three things that I'm going to talk about that helps. Um, it's the reason why you should, um, it's very important for us to educate ourselves financially. Okay, wonderful. So that is uh, the importance as I've noticed is that to be able to make a uh, probably informed decision in terms of how you're sharing the resources as well as it helps to maybe improve the, the economy and also it brings the financial inclusion. Yeah, and so maybe that leads me to the next question. And maybe I'm, I'm trying to wonder because I know, as, as a, especially because I'm an analyst and I've done a, a project on financial inclusion sometimes back, and I, it was a case scenario for, for Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and you could find that on a, or having a bank account was one of the, the key metrics to determine whether there is a success in terms of financial inclusion or not. Then if that is the case, then I would wonder, should I take my money to the bank in order for me to be able to know probably that I'm, I'm, I'm financially educated or where should I take the money? Yeah. And if, yeah. if, I, take, if I take the money to the bank, then, I, I also try to wonder, or maybe someone would be asking, does it mean that the bank is so secure and, uh, and I'm making the, the informed decision in terms of financial uh, research or what? Maybe you could tell us more about that. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Samuel, again with this question. Uh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> you know, I learned so much from the um, the research and the survey that we did in the markets. It's kind of a, the same question. People were like, I am not going to keep my money at the bank. Why? Because why do I have to queue so long to wait for a longer time before I get my own money that I place in the bank? Why do I go spend a longer hours at the bank, like 10, 20 minutes or 40 minutes at the bank just to take my own money? So it's better I keep it at home. You get that. But then that is the central goal of financial education that we are to guide people, we are to train them, we are to educate them and help them to be well equipped in making these financial choices and to help them to make smart money choices in terms of how they can be able to 
handle their money, whether or not the decision to keep their money at the bank, whether or not to keep their money at home, it lies under the kind of orientation these people have. And I believe that when you are financially informed, I like I actually love scenarios when I want to when I'm making presentations. You know, there are two kind of individuals. The question boils down about the credibility assessment you do and the trust you can have with the bank if you want to save. Um, savings is one of the most important, you know, the basic concept of financial education. That if you enter into any financial education class, they are going to tell you to save. Now the decision as to whether to save at the bank or not to save at the bank, whether the bank is insured or whether the bank is not insured, depend on how you're oriented and information you have at your disposal. Why do I say this? Um, Samuel, you, you realize that um, there are two individuals, a two scenario set of questions. One would have himself, do I have to go and say because of the juicy package that is being given to me? Oh yeah, I've heard that this bank A is, is doing well. If you put your money there, it's going to give you a, a higher interest about 30%. This bank is going to do this. Is that a reason why you want to save? Or you want to save because you think that, oh, this bank is just a stone throw. I can just go there and access my money. Or this bank is just giving me, because as the woman, as the market woman said, she thinks that she, don't, she doesn't have to keep so long at the bank taking her own money. So if another bank comes offering her that, oh, if you come just today, within one minute, I'm going to give you your money. Are you supposed to just follow? What decisions are you supposed to take? All these things come through um, and you about how you are financially informed. But let's look at the second scenario and a set of questions someone who is financially literate would, 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 would consider in terms of whether to keep the money at the bank or not, or whether the bank is insured or not. This boils down to like asking questions like, what are some of the financial goals? Is it, um, is it, is it do I have a goal that I, I have to save? Do I have a plan that is the amount that I want to save or not? Is there a need for me to save the money at the bank? How much money am I supposed to save every month at the bank? Or if I want to save at the bank, what are some of the things I need to do? The same individual who is financially educated will think about how they can look at the alternatives among these choices and to select. And they are going to run this based on a criteria, looking, doing more due diligence and doing a background check about the bank. How has been their, how their, their performance have been so far? How long have, have they been in operation? And how, what is their, their quality of services that they provide? Are they regulated? Are these banks registered? Are they licenses to operate? These are some of the questions a financial literate person is going to ask themselves before they move. Are they going to save because of the juicy packages that they've had? So I think with the question of whether to save at the bank or not, depends on your retention and education you have. That is the reason why we are calling on people or stakeholders to join us to educate people. Because if you want to build the Africa we want, people should be able to uh, learn how to handle their finances, even not just the household individuals or the individuals, but the governments, institutions and organizations should be able to learn how to handle their finances. So you will realize that before you even handle the question, you need to also make analysis try to look at one or two things, ask questions before you save at the bank. And that's the decision you need to make. That's the education that if you are financially educated, you ask yourself before you even go to save or rather or not to save. So that's the little thing I'm going to talk about that. So it is very, very safe for you to keep your money at the bank. But the question comes is, what is your goal? Why do you want to save? Is this bank regulated? Are this bank giving the service, the quality of services they're supposed to provide it? What are the alternative products? All of these questions you need to ask yourself before you, you even um, go into saving so that you can understand how you, you can move on. Okay, thank you so much. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, I think that answered. And maybe by, by answering them, it means uh, it takes me maybe to the next question because probably there is one of our viewers who could be asked now you have said uh, that we save the money probably we take the money to the bank and maybe i've done some analysis but if you remember from my introduction uh, introductory statement i said that we know the bank has really played a, a very big role in terms of financial inclusion and financial literature but there are these small uh, micro finances that are still coming up like you call them I think some of them are uh, credit unions, 
Disabled to be asked, maybe does it mean that I take my, my money to a credit bank or a, I mean credit union or take it to the bank? And if that is a scenario, then maybe someone is asking, what's the, what's the, difference, between, uh, what's the difference between the bank and the credit union? So I thanks very much again um, for that. It's um, it's all a matter. It's all about a matter of um, choices and then the, the well-informed decisions you make. So it boils down again the need for us to be financially educated. It's very very important as a continent and um, as we are looking up to becoming one of the best continents around the globe. Um, it's paramount and very crucial that our members are well educated in terms of financial literacy education. So uh, this is some of the things that if you get to understand these things, the decision whether to save at a credit union or at the banks, all depends on how you are oriented. But then I just want to say one or two things. Um, one, uh, in terms of, uh, I'm going to talk in terms of their profitability, their membership, and in terms of um, loans and how the account operates. So in the normal traditional banks that we see, the banks that comes around that moves along that we see are much more into their profit oriented. And um, they are looking at jail towards trying to, at the end of the day, they don't want to run a loss. And if you look at that of a credit union, uh, before you let, let me let me just go this way. Let me not even talk about the profit making and let me talk about the membership first. Then if you understand how you can join these individuals, you can know whether to, um, then we go down back to the uh, the profit making. Now, when you talk about the membership between these two, banks usually would have shareholders. When I talk about shareholders, um, people that uh, are buying stake into a very particular um, organization and it's open to everyone. Any other body can move on to the stock exchange and then buy a share in any bank that is listed on the stock market or maybe have ownership in any bank. But that comes to a credit union. For a credit union, it is strictly by membership. You have to tender in your application that you want to become a member and you have to tender in that you need to meet the requirement of becoming a member else there is no way you can be able to join a credit union. So if you want to take your money to a credit union savings, you are subscribing to becoming part and part of like a cooperative in running the affairs of that very particular or maybe handling the affairs of the credit union to a particular individual or a group of people for persons who you want them to run this credit union for them. But banks does not operate that way. Banks have shareholders who even, I can even, anybody here can go on the stock exchange market and buy shares in any of the banks. Across the, across the continent. So if you enter the African market, you enter the uh, Johannesburg stock exchange market, the Nigerian stock exchange market, the Ghana stock exchange market through a broker, you can buy a stake in any listed bank that is on the market. But when it comes to credit union, you cannot do that. You have to walk to either the credit union, their branches or their headquarters, and then talk to them that you want to become a member of that into application. So that's one of the, 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 the difference between this um, the bank and the credit union. Another thing, it, it depends on the wide range of products that have been provided by these people. So credit union has a little bit fewer um, um, products, wide range of that, again, maybe like savings and loans, that is all, where maybe at the point where they can go to, or maybe do one or two simple or basic um, investments, unlike banks where they can move into more sophisticated um, investments, they can do more wider range of products even, and maybe they can, look at other, um, trying to build other portfolios in terms of the investment, they are trying to give other commercial packages, so many commercial packages, unlike that of the credit union. And another benefit of you getting to a credit union is that because you are part and parcel as, as, as a member, when in terms of advancing of loans, the interest payment you get is a little bit minimal. So unlike a bank, remember they said they are profit oriented, they want to make money. So they take deposit from individuals and they lend those individuals, uh, the money to individuals and they make money out of the monies that they lend or the loans, the advances to individuals or banks or any other um, institutions that they work with. So they charge high interest on loans 
as compared to that of credit union because it's a membership, it's a cooperative society. They try and look at helping each other grow. So there is a minimal interest um, that you could pay on that. And when it comes to the deposits, um, anybody can open an account as a, with the banks. As I said earlier, you cannot just walk to a credit union and say, I, I just want to deposit my open an account. You have to pass through the membership procedure. Unlike bank that you have to just go that you want to open an account and then you just go and open an account. So I think um, that's one of the um, kind of a little um, difference that I'm going to talk about uh, when it comes to a credit union. So membership is required, straight membership at banks, you're a shareholder, you can go to the stock exchange and get some when it comes to opening of accounts. With banks, anyone can, but with uh, credit unions, you have to become a member before you can open an account. When it comes to loans and advances, banks are charging high because it's aimed at making profits, unlike credit unions that are seen to the benefit of their members. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, much appreciated for that. And uh, even like I now understand the difference because I was like, you no. Know, Where's the difference? Where's the difference? But I think now, I think now I really understand that. And maybe now I, I can even be able to share more on, like if someone asked me, should I go to, to a bank or should I go to a credit union? I think I'm, I'm at a point of able to explain to them. And I know probably when someone is maybe depositing the money to the bank or maybe to a credit union and all that and maybe borrowing, what should they be caring more about, or do you think they should be caring more about their credit score? Because I know probably at one point, maybe someone may be taking the money to the bank because he or she has like a plan maybe to get a loan at the end of the day, or maybe to a credit union, maybe to get a, to get some facilitation in terms of financial assets. So should I be worried about, or why should I be, more of like careful about my credit score yeah thanks very much samuel um it's it's very important um let me just also i uh, respond to this question in in a scenario for among your peers maybe whether your colleagues at work home or maybe anywhere that you have friends that you've met maybe yeah, you you know them very well and you know some of your friends can give you a recommendation about you that, oh, Samuel is a good guy, Philip, yeah. I think Philip, I can vouch for him, he's good. But here lies the case where you took money from Samuel, you took money from Yao, you took money from Peter, you took money from Barbara, and you didn't pay. You couldn't, the commitment you said you're gonna pay, you didn't do that. At the end of the day, you went to you went back to Samuel to collect the money. What do you think Samuel is going to do? Yes, Samuel. What what are you going to do? I come back to you asking you for the money. The money that I took, I didn't pay. If I come back asking you for another additional money, what are you going to say? What are you going to do? So definitely, I I might be reluctant to give you the money because definitely you have to repay the one that I gave you in order to assure me that if I give you more then you can be able to repay it again. Exactly. So that answers perfectly why you should worry so much about your, your, your credit score. Because if you are not credit wealthy, it brings a question in the minds of the credit analyst who wants to advance the loan to you or the organization that wants to advance the loans to you. You have to actually, if you have a low rating, among even your peers as the scenario that we gave and someone is not even willing to share the money or to give me an, an, more an advance um, or is not committed to even give me a, an additional loan for what I've already taken. That should tell you that, yeah, with the questions of you trying to make this payment is important. But you know, generally we have, um, uh, we have issues um, in terms of um, looking at um, the continent at large. I was just trying to think about some of these things and I realized that we have issues in terms of our credit rating system, which have to put in place. Sometimes with our addressing system, all these things come together to help us address this issue as a continent. If we have these systems put in place where we can easily go there and check the background of people, because most of the financial institutions, financial services sector are falling with non-performing loans. 
in their balance in, in their in their balance sheet or in their books be all because of the non-performing loans because they advance loans to people or they give credit, credit or loans to people and you realize that they cannot trace them back again and take the money so trying to even to put or to gather information about people trying to assess them based on their credit score it becomes very difficult here in a continent which maybe um any other um financial institutions that are on the platform are joining this conference should also try and see how they can work around that the central banks have a very what they have to try and strengthen this system that anybody can just go there and check about this guy that what is his credit score what is his credit rating what is his assessment has he been paying all these things has to be done unlike where we have u.s systems like transunion we have like that of equifax there are all these credit rating systems that uh, people can easily assess your credit score and whether whether or not to make a decision about that however we are doing well and you you have to score high the recommendation for your friends have to be 100 percent not even 100 percent per se but then it has to be it has to reach a certain percentage Yao should have confidence that oh philip i vouch for him oh philip i vouch for him peter oh philip i vouch for him that could help them to say okay then let's give him the let's give him the credits let's let's give him the loan the, the loan facility the amount is because this guy he pays on time this guy he's spending habits these are some of the things that they check whether your spending habits are okay whether you are spending so well whether you qualify for an additional loans they make all these checks before they vote on so you need to take a critical look about all, all these things because if you're wondering why you were not um giving the loan is because maybe you after putting up your credit report history or your credit history they realize that um you've not been taking you've not been paying your debt on time you are struggling to get out of debt you don't have any repayments a strong repayment plan and it becomes very difficult for these people to to vouch for you to for them to and then one of the things that they check is that um, in terms of calculating, they look at your payment history, how well you've been making your payments. They also look at your financial and buying behaviors as has made, has made already. The last loan that you, take, you took, were you able to make good use of it? What did you actually use it for the purpose which is what you intended for? Or were you just spending it anyhow? How do you even spend that you still need an advance? Were you, are you someone that can um, if they entrust or give the loan to you, or you can be able to pay them back. So it is very important you you, you critical look at it. Else you keep on wondering why you are, you are not being given that kind of loan for your business or setup. Uh, it's because of our spending habits and because of uh, um, the issues that we have with the commitment to pay back or make repayment of all our loans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. And, uh, you know, like you remind me of, uh, of a project that I, in fact, it's a research that I saw uh, that was discussing about the credit score, especially like in a setup like Kenya, and whereby they could be able to check how long, how long are you online? How long does your phone keep charge? How many times maybe do you make, uh, do you buy credit or do you refill your, your credit? And a lot of other factors that were put in place and that was, it was shocking to see that even those people with uh, like phones that goes off they had a low low i mean credit score and it could really be able to influence like when they are going to maybe get a credit so i think as you said more of uh, factors need to be put in place in order also to avoid uh, chances of maybe being a bad credit so and uh, I think more, more, more as as you have said has has to be done, and more research has to be done as well, especially to people in finance like you, which I'm doing. Like I believe you're you're doing a exemplary good. So now and uh, maybe someone could be asking. So I've I've I have a good credit. So do I need to save? And if I need to save, how can I save my money? Should I take it to the bank? Should I take it to a credit union? Should I keep it in my house or what's the best way to like save my money or could it be in terms of maybe take it to the stock exchange or where, where exactly should I save my money? Oh, okay. So um, another wonderful question. And uh, I think um, 
it's <laughs> I'm interested in the fact that the financial education should be given the necessary attention it needs. And I'm grateful that um, we and other colleagues that are around are trying to do these things um, to make sure that people are financially educated and also improve the status of financial education in Africa so that everyone will be financially included. It's going to help us to make smart money choices. It's going to help us uh, being alleviated from this poverty, this um, economic issues, high illiteracy that you made mention in the earlier um, background presentation that you were giving. Uh, some people are, are not, um, they're not educated, not just because um, it's their choice. I grew up in a rural area and I've seen those things. It's because some of the parents couldn't um, have that opportunity to send their award to school or give them the better education because of finances. And you know, when I was growing up, I realized one thing that some of the farmers within these areas have enough money. After harvest, they get it so much money, but then they find it very difficult whether or not to go and save the money or whether or not to keep it under their beds. And you know, they get like 100,000 rands, 100,000 sefa, 100,000 Ghana CDs, Naira, and they just go and keep it under the bed. Waiting for five years in order to take their award to school or waiting for five years enough for them to buy a land or to buy a house. But they've forgotten that in the long run, when inflation set in that money, the purchasing power of that very particular amount, 100,000 Naira that was kept for under the bed for five years will lose its value. The money under the bed cannot appreciate yeah. whilst you kept you, it is being kept under the pillow or under the bed <laughs> so anytime they, they find one thing they find very difficult in terms of trying to grow the funds that they have so that bonds that comes back to um the question that how can one save but even before I, I i respond to that i think we are doing well as a continent in terms of looking at the status around people are now trying to save because our mobile money uh, mobile banking a setting is making life diff uh, so easy for us in terms of our savings. Someone can just walk to any mobile money joint and then they save. Um, I think one study that talks about um, mobile banking in Africa, the progress is, is awesome. So we should still con continue to try and then um, help um, put this thing together because it helps bridge um, financial exclusion and also help people um, develop the habit of saving. And um, one thing that I also want to talk about even people that are in the informal sector, they are having issues. The issues in, with regard to saving is so high than the informal sector. I thought in the urban cities or in the urban areas, everything is perfect. You have high education, high, high, high literacy level is over there. People are well educated and all those things. But believe you me, be that as it may, you realize that even people at the end of the month, before their salaries hit the account, they have zero in the account because they are betting with debt. Because of the impulse buying, before even at the end of the month, what the spending, the kind of spending, they buy things that they want instead of buying the things that they need for the family. They don't plan even together as household. They don't sit down and talk about how they can be able to save. They don't do those things. So we, 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 we are too quick to judge that the informal sector are the ones that have issues with savings. They cannot keep anything. But because this former sector, because they have the opportunity to pass through their bank accounts, that's where they have the opportunity to save. But then some people too don't even save at all. They spend their money even before upon, upon arrival. But I think that there is still room for improvement. And this is a wonderful course we've taken to. Um, and we are, we are looking forward to working with so many people in terms of collaborating to that. But then um, that comes to the way we are all seeing the African we want in a way where we can boost the, uh, the habit of saving and also try and help people to accept the culture of investment uh, within the continent. And um, it's, it has to be passed from generation to generation. But getting started with saving, you know, with every step, I love scenarios. With a child, before a child make a, make, um, try to walk, there is a first step to everything that you do. I think um, travel for change our um, adventures before it started it's kind of people they even give attention to it but we we uh, together with your team you guys made a first step and that is what has resulted us here today that center financial literacy education 
um, Africa has the platform to also to uh, discuss and myself also have the opportunity to discuss. So you first have to develop the mindset because if you don't have the development of the mindset to save, there is no way you can start saving. You have to develop the mindset of having to put your financial house in order. That's the first step, the growth mindset, other than the fixed mindset where I think that, oh, money is going to come at the end of the month, so there is no need. Oh, I'll save tomorrow. But then if you have that, develop that kind of uh, culture or habit in you, you rather look at saving. You can earn 10,000 Ghana CDs and still go broke at the end of the month and earn 1,000 Ghana CDs and still at least be able to sustain yourself. The next thing you need to do is to assess your need, um, whether or not you are going to save or not. How much do you need to save, as we may mention um, earlier? And you know, the goal is not to becoming, uh, the goal of financial independence or financial freedom is not to become rich overnight. It's a gradual process. You need to follow the process. As I may mention, it is not an event. It is a process you need to follow. So when you get into savings, you need to first have the habits, develop the mindset that I'm going to save. This is how I want to go. Do I need to save? Why should I need to save? Do I have a plan? You cannot say because I earn 10,000 Ghana cities, I want to save um, 5,000 Ghana cities just like that, or 5,000 rands, or 5,000 say for 5,000 naira just like that, or 5,000 shillings, or anyhow, what uh, any other you know, currency that you use, um, we use in our uh, in, in our various countries. You have to set a plan. You have to build your financial goal, analyze your cash flows, where money comes in, how money goes out. Then you know the actual amounts through budgeting, what you need to save. You cannot say, um, you have a goal that I'm going to save um, 10,000 Ghana cities at the end of the, or 10,000 Naira or 10,000 um, dollars or whatever amount you want to save at the end of the, of, of the year. But you have to consider your salaries, you have to consider your needs, your expenses, all these things and know how much you need to save. If not, you're just going to um, be saving and you're still running the problem and just be going and taking the money. And money that you have even invested, you go in and you withdraw with penalties and charges because you have to withdraw early and all those things and you still not put your house in order. So it's very necessary for you to um, analyze your cash flows, draft a budget and know the amounts that you need to save. There are so many numerous budgeting um, procedures you can go through. Um, you can use the 50, 30, 20. You can use the 60, 40. We have so many 80, 20, so many rules that maybe in the future we can look on. We can look into that. And um, after that, you need to understand that this budgeting role plays a very important role. It helps you to control, to plan, and you'll be able to know how to manage your funds very effective. So you don't just wake up and save. How can I save? So you just go and save. You need to pass through all this process and decide whether this percentage of my uh, amount that I'm going to save at a month should go to my emergency funds, should go to my retirement account, should go to my investment account, should go to insurance. Philip? Hello, Philip. So I think uh, we have lost Phil. Maybe I think it's because of a uh, network issue. But I think he was sharing more on uh, the saving culture. And so uh, I believe that we can be able to do a lot in terms of uh, saving because I know that uh, another way of making uh, saving it could also be like um, whereby you, <coughs> you you can be able to give maybe instructions to the bank but that on a specific day that i'm authorizing that you maybe deduct some amount it could be two dollars ten dollars based on maybe what you give the, you you give them and tell them that you you want them to maybe deduct the, the cash from uh, your account. So, Philip. Yeah, hello, Samuel. Sorry, sorry, I, my line went off, so I had to jump in my phone. So maybe as as we conclude, as we try to conclude, uh, because you are sharing on uh, 
maybe the ways of maybe people can be able to save money and uh, i was adding a point that maybe you can uh, since it's something that maybe you're not used to and you cannot be able to do it on a specific day the best other another best way to do it is by you know maybe instructing a bank to be able to to deduct some money and take it to your account that i think that could Stop. also work like for me that's what i've done so sometimes that's i it. even forget that i'm saving <laughs> exactly so maybe <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. That. That is it. So I. 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 Um. Upon wrapping up. Um. About the savings, I think. Um. Uh, I'd wanted to even make a commitment that. Um. Uh -huh. that we are building Africa. African together. If we start that, we can do that standing order, or maybe deduction mm -hmm. on account. That mm -hmm. after we've decided that is the percentage that we need to. Um. Okay. At the end of the day, we, we can save twenty percent of our, our salary of our earnings. After drafting our budgets, looking at other incomes that comes in, we can save like 20%. So with this 20%, 10%, or out of the 20%, five should go to my retirement, five should go to um uh, what do you call it? Uh, my my emergency funds, others should go to my investment account or insurance. Then you decide and then you tell your banks that upon arrival, this should be all that that okay. This amount should be deducted from my account automatic when the money hits the account. So I think that's a way to you can save. Um, you can you can do that saving. And then another thing you can do also is that um, today we have uh, we are moving in in a, in, a, in a digital world. We have mobile ba banking. You can sit at your comfort um, just at your home, very comfortable, and then you just save your money. You just send your money to your bank. You can just cross the other streets, look at the empty merchant or the vendor. The money vendor, whatever, sort of, um, whatever um, network you use in your country that runs these mobile money services, you just tell them that, okay, fine, uh, pay money into the account. So it should be something that is very easy. We have people that are coming around, taking the monies from the banks that you, you, you join. So it, it's something that, but then all boys now with the financial discipline, you have to be disciplined. Yeah. Um, you have to set your mind up. You said that this is what I want to do. Because um, it, you can even wake up one day because you realize that you are too stressed. You don't budget. You don't have the mindset of saving. You just walk to your bank and tell them that, hey, no, you people should stop that order. I am not, don't, do not deduct any money on account again. I am not doing insurance again. I'm not doing retirement again. I'm not having enough money. So you have to be financially disciplined when it comes to that. And, and that, that is central to all, um, whether or not, when you, ask, when you ask questions about to save or not save, how you can save, sure. Yeah. So thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much. I hope that answers the question. Maybe what 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 could not be able to uh, thank you, the kind of information that you have shared. But before we maybe end this uh, meeting, maybe you could just uh, your parting words for this session, because we did really, we are really grateful for what you have shared with us. Hello? Sure. Are you said? Your yeah, yeah, can as, I hear as you? We end this meeting, as I'm saying, as we end this meeting, because we are supposed to be ending it. Okay. And, uh, and we really appreciate as travel for change. And uh, maybe for the viewers, I know they really appreciate for the session. It was informative and all that. So maybe as, as what, what could be your parting words? Oh, okay. That is great. So I, I think that um, um, it is a call that we all, as um, we are building an African that we want, should get ourselves educated in terms of financial literacy. Um, it's kind of um, not taught. We have um, these courses that are run in schools and it is your responsibility that you put your, your house um, in order, your financial house in order. It's no one's responsibility. It's um, you yourself and no one else. Okay that you need to understand that in order for you to get to the point of amazing wealth, it's a process. Financial literacy, education's goal is not to become rich overnight. It's about you becoming self-sufficient, self-reliant. And when you continue to walk through this process, that is when the wealth building comes in. 
that is where you can create the, the enough wealth that you, you, you want. Think about saving, plan about family, plan about your, your work, plan about everything that you do, try to organize your house, try to organize your finances. Make sure that you save, 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 Thank save. And when you're saving, all, you. remember Thank saving you. is not investment. Saving is not investment. You so and you always yeah. have to make uh, you 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 put you put the savings down. I hope my time. Hello. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate. Hello. And uh, on behalf of uh, Travel for Change, Hello. you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. So I'm saying on behalf of Travel for Change, I really take this opportunity to thank you so much and to thank you, our viewers, for listening to this session. And I hope it was informative. So thank you so much. Uh, let's meet again for the next session. Thank you.